using Zoom, um, as, as Amy uh, Kay asked us, please mute yourself unless you're speaking and we do wanna hear from you later on. Um, if, you, if you haven't already, um, please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, just let us know, your name will obviously come up, but let us know your title and your institution so we can get to know who's on the call. Um, we are recording the session um, and we'll make the recording and the slides available to you uh, afterwards. Um, and again, we'd like this to be an open discussion, um, at least right now, I think it's a manageable group to have a conversation. Um, but when we get to the discussion period, um, I ask you to use the chat to just indicate that you'd like to speak. Um, you can just say, I have a comment or I have a question um, and we'll get to you in time. Um, we know that you're people who have great ideas um, and are deeply involved in this stuff. So we're very much looking forward to talking to you and learning from you. So Emily. Um, so our agenda is as, as follows. Um, we hope to spend the first um, 20 to 25 minutes um, learning about the 9-11 uh, National Day of Service and Remembrance, its history and its mission. Um, and we'll get a chance to talk a little bit to, uh, about GW's uh, Welcome Day of Service and Convocation um, and how we're rethinking our approach. Um, and then we really want to hear from you and hear you share your ideas uh, about how we can really rethink this. Um, it's, it's a new day and we have a, a new way to do this. And then we want to uh, con connect and share our messaging. Um, I want to begin with a quick video um, that gives you a sense of and prepares you for uh, the National uh, Day of Service and Remembrance on 9-11. Um, this will just give you a sense of the holiday and where the, the, the commemoration day um, and where we are. Emily, you're muted. Okay. In the immediate aftermath of the attacks, what was so remarkable to me was the way the country came together in this incredible spirit of unity where everybody was helping each other. Tens of millions of people marked the day by doing good deeds in honor of those who perished and those who rose in service, but also as a positive path. Today, we're aboard the Intrepid on the Hudson River in New York City, but we're also expanding this year into Phoenix, LA, and San Francisco. And so all told, we'll pack 1.7 million meals for food challenge people in those four markets. And that'll be done by more than 8,000 volunteers. So it's a really remarkable sort of melting pot of volunteers that are here to demonstrate the importance of togetherness we're pushing back against those who really attack our way of life. Ultimately, our objective is to take this day of evil, 9-11, and turn it into a day of good and encourage people to remember 9-11 every year by doing good deeds to help others in need. We encourage people all the time to make their first stop on our website, 911day.org. You can find volunteer opportunities in your own community and lots of other resources. There's just so many sort of little good deeds that we want people to do, and that's how we think we change the world one good deed at a time. Every time I watch that video, um, I am moved, um, and I am in, I'm partly moved um, because of our next uh, guest, guests, David Payne, who's the president and co-founder of 9-11 Day and My Good Deed. Um, and as well as Jay Winnick, um, who is uh, the other co-founder of 9-11 Day and My Good Deed. And I'm really pleased that they can be with us today to talk about uh, their, their history, their vision, and their mission. Um, David, let me turn it over to you. Um, thank you, Amy uh, uh, and Emily, and uh, Amy as well. I really appreciate uh, you putting this opportunity for us uh, together so that we would have a chance to talk a little bit more about who we are and what we're doing and of course how we're adjusting like all of you to the COVID-19 pandemic. It certainly has, has thrown I think everyone a curveball. 
uh, but I think as you'll you'll hear from Jay, it, from our perspective, it's made the um, the September 11th National Day of Service, what we call 9/11 Day, more important potentially than ever. Um, maybe just by way of uh, background and history, you, you may be aware that our nonprofit was created uh, by the 9/11 community very soon after the September 11th attacks, and I think for many people who lost loved ones on 9/11, including Jay, who lost his brother. Uh, uh, there was just this feeling that something good had to come from that terrible tragedy. And uh, more than anything else, we didn't want the, the terrorists to have the opportunity to forever define for generations to come how, um, how our nation and our children were gonna learn about and remember 9-11 uh, you know, year after year after year. And uh, rather than pass on to future generations what the terrorists did to us, we were inspired instead by this incredible uh, spirit of unity and togetherness and compassion that arose in the immediate aftermath of the attacks. And that was the legacy that we wanted to pass along and the one that we felt would be important for our children to learn about. That even in difficult times and times of adversity, that we get through that together by helping one another and by being empathetic to the differences that we might have and ultimately arising uh, above the challenges we might face. And so that became our mission to transform 9-11 from a day of tragedy into a day of doing good. And thanks to the help of uh, uh, George Washington University, many other schools around the country, tens of thousands of teachers that, that do engage their, their, their students in service learning related to 9-11 every year. And of course, many, many nonprofits and employers that have supported us We've been very successful in turning September 11th into the nation's largest day of service uh, on an annual basis with more than 30 million people who participate every year. And as you may be aware, in 2009, uh, it, it, September 11th was formally designated as a national day of service and remembrance under federal law and through presidential proclamation. So September 11th and Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday are the, two, the only two federally designated days of service in our country today. If you want to learn a little bit more about us, you can always go to 911day.org, and there's a lot of interesting information there, um, uh, history, background. There's also a ton of terrific lesson plans, service learning materials that Amy, uh, Emily, and their team helped prepare for us. So a lot of great resources, and you can expect us to to uh, load up, uh, upload a whole bunch of new toolkits, toolkits to help organizations understand sort of how to deal with 9/11 in this current environment. Uh, I will tell you that what you do, particularly if you work with young people, is absolutely vital to us because as much as we've been around now for, you know, 19 years, uh, 18, 19 years, only about a, th a third of the nation is aware that September 11th is a day of service under federal law. And, and so particularly as it re relates to young people in the next generation, we really are depending upon you to, to get them involved, to learn about what September 11th uh, uh, as a day of service has become and how they can participate and what the ritual is. Uh, it is very much, of course, about physical volunteering, but it's also about just simply doing goods and doing good deeds and helping each other and being compassionate. And so uh, literally young children can do the dishes or help a sibling do their homework that day, or they could go through uh, 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 their, their toy chest and give away things they don't play with any longer or clothing uh, that they don't wear anymore, that they've outgrown. There is just so many really uh, uh, personal and interesting things that people can and should do on 9-11. And particularly as we get closer to the anniversary this year, you know, that, that'll be even more true um, uh, in light of what's going on with the pandemic. Uh, so so uh, what I'd like to do is maybe touch up briefly on what we're planning to do for 9-11 in the face of the COVID virus and then turn it over to Jay to give you sort of the perspective of a person who really helped create this day as a 9-11 family member and who really understands the, the, the essence of what we're trying to do here. So just quickly, um, maybe many of you may be thinking about physical volunteering. Is that still possible when the 9-11 day of service comes up? And the answer is absolutely yes. And not only is it possible, it's happening across the country now more than ever. Uh, there are, of course, rules that you everyone needs to follow, social distancing, making sure that you're wearing masks, that you're being careful, that you're working under the guidance of, of, of criteria and protocol that keep you safe and the people around you safe. But there is a tremendous need for people to engage in physical volunteering. 
And uh, all across the country, we're anticipating that we will have some project activities that we'll be implementing ourselves where, where volunteers will be assembling meals for people in need. It's gonna look a lot different than what we've done in the past where we used to have thousands of people in one room. Now there may be only a couple hundred and they may be distanced significantly, but nonetheless, uh, as a matter of protocol and patriotism, we're, we're not stepping back, we're, we're actively participating. So we encourage you to think about ways in which you can engage peace build through physical volunteering as, virtu as well as virtual volunteering for 9-11 if you can. Like I said, there's just a wealth of things that, can people, that people can do considering that good deed doing is really what 9-11 is all about. That is a virtual activity right then and there. So with that, I'm gonna uh, maybe just ask my, my great friend and my co-founder who is the, the conscience of this entire observance, uh, Jay Winnick, to speak a little bit about his background and, and just tell you what it means to him and why he thinks this, this upcoming observance is particularly important. Jay? Amy, what do you think? Am I the conscious of it? <laughs> <laughs> You're conscious. <laughs> yeah, I'm conscious. <laughs> David, thank you uh, for that great summary and uh, nice introduction. Uh, you know, when we started this as a grassroots initiative, we really had no idea. We had great dreams that it would grow into something substantial and something that had legs, would last over time. But we had um, really no way until jumping into it and sticking with it for some years that it would grow into the nation's largest annual day of charitable engagement. And I think the secret sauce to that is um, people's uh, natural inclination to want to do something uh, in the face of tragic times, whether they're man-made or um, natural. And this time that we're going through now is uh, reminiscent of that time uh, in a lot of ways. You know, people just people just want to help any way they can. And the way we established the day was with that framework in mind, you know, not telling everybody to do the same thing, to engage in good deeds and charitable service in the aftermath of 9-11, but rather just do something in your own comfort zone. And that really struck a chord with America because it's so easy to participate. And so, you know, that is really what we ran with. And as you see the response now to the uh, pandemic, People just want to pitch in. There's some frustration, of course, because we can't physically come together the way we did after 9-11 and continue to do each 9-11, but there's no shortage of, of ways that people can participate and people are finding those ways. So uh, the reaction's remarkable. As, as successful as this uh, annual observance has been uh, through these 18 plus years, it's very clear to us, those who are engaged in this day in and day out, that this upcoming September 11th may be the most important one that we've had yet, with potentially the greatest participation, even with some physical distancing, because the need is, is extraordinary. You know, we don't have to explain to any of you just how uh, people are hurting out there, uh, both in terms of uh, those who are food insecure, but in so many other ways. Um, and so, there's also the facility uh, through technology or otherwise for people to be supportive of other people to do good deeds, even if social distancing is still in place, uh, you know, come five or so months from now. So this uh, combination of uh, an annual day of service on the calendar, and as David says, is only one of two federally designated as such, uh, and this extraordinary need combined with maybe a time in the calendar when we all feel even more comfortable than we are now about getting out there and doing something, it really is going to be something uh, historic. It really will be historic. And, you know, just coming back to the 9-11 component of it, um, this is something that the 9-11 community at large, of which, you know, there are millions, uh, tens and tens of thousands of people who, who are in that community, including first responders, this is something they really get behind and something that's really meaningful. And it is the last year before the 20th anniversary of 9-11, you know, I mean, can you believe it, 20 years ago almost, um, which will be an extraordinary observance. And so even as we gear up to pivot to a different way uh, to observe 9-11 than we have in years past, uh, we are also thinking forward to the 20th anniversary, which will really be uh, an extraordinary global uh, observance. So that's my two cents. 
So thank you so much, Jay. Thank you, David. Um, it's really, we're, we're really honored to have you with us today and um, are looking forward to your participation as we go through um, the rest of this. Um, we would not have a 9-11 day of service and remembrance um, were it not for the two of you and your, um, your civic activism um, in creating this day. So thank you. Um, I had hoped that uh, Rhonda Taylor from the Corporation for National and Community Service would, would join us at this point. Rhonda, are you on? I don't see her name. She may be able to join us later um, in the call uh, to talk a little bit about what the corporation has done. Um, but as you can see, we've got um, the Honey W. Nashman Center slide up on uh, the screen. The Nashman Center integrates uh, civic engagement into GW's educational work. I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the work that we do. Um, you can see that, like many of you, we are a full service uh, civic engagement center. Uh, basically, what I mean by that um, is that we see ourselves all across the campus um, working on service and civic engagement in a wide variety of ways through co curricular service um, as well as through service through the, um, the academic mission of the institution. Um, this is our mission. We promote equi equity and active citizenship in a diverse democracy um, and focus the university's resources um, to address community needs beyond our campus um, while enhancing teaching, learning, and scholarship at GW. Um, you can move to the next slide, Emily. Um, and again, this is the wide variety of ways um, in which we do this. Um, and I think that's part of um, our challenge always as we think about immersion service, um, how, the, how we start off our school year, um, which we do with a convocation um, and a welcome day of service, and how we connect that up with the broader messages across the university, um, as well as the message of 9-11. How do we help to, um, shape students' experiences so that when they come to our university, uh, they understand themselves to be connected to an academic, civic, and community mission, as well as to the broader national mission um, of service and civic engagement. Um, and these are our, uh, the variety of our direct program um, strategies. I'd like to introduce now a very brief video um, it's from a few years ago, um, so some of the personnel have changed, and you will see that uh, this is our welcome day of service, which we need to change. Emily, unmute. This is our sixth year in a row that we've uh, had our freshman day of service connected with the commemoration of the September 11th uh, attacks. Uh, it's our way of kind of recognizing that tragedy, but also translating it to something uh, very positive for our students in terms of their engagement with the community. I think GW's uh, day of service for freshmen is a fantastic way to get the students really acclimated into the community to understand who's out there, who's doing what, how they can be helpful, and how they can be a part of it. There are always going to be communities in need. There's always important causes to be able to work on. And you really have an opportunity as a member of a college community to do more than just um, be in the classroom and study. This is also a learning opportunity about, about the real world. I think community service is really important for students for a variety of reasons. One is it gets them involved in the community outside the college. So they get to meet people that they wouldn't ordinarily meet um, in their everyday lives here at school. We are part of this great capital city. But that's not just about Congress and the White House and, and the other institutions that surround us. It's also about the rich tapestry of the neighborhoods of Washington, D.C., which I think is a very important part of their education, at the same time that they're developing solidarity with their fellow students by doing some hands-on work together early in their college career. My advice to the freshman class of GW members who are going to volunteer today is to think about their service today. Think about who they're helping and make it a part of their lives, not just a one day event, but let this be the start of many days of the Dean for others. It's really tremendous. It's a banner day for GW. So you can see that we have um, 
quite a bit of work to do to think about how to reimagine this event that connects um, students to their school and students to the world um, on that day. So one of the ways that we're beginning to think about how we will do that this year, um, as, as David, I think, said very clearly, yes, we will have some in-person service on this day of service, but as we think about how to create a unified message um, to welcome our students back, um, we've actually started thinking about using the pathways of public service and civic engagement. This is a tool developed by Stanford University and now used at a, a wide variety of colleges um, that help really help us just to think about um, different ways that we do service. This is the way, uh, that it, it actually got started as a way to help students think about service careers, uh, but we're using it to help students to think about the kinds of service that they do. Um, so community engaged learning and research um, is one that we promote heavily uh, for our students and hope that they'll engage in a service learning class or some other community engaged uh, learning experience. Students can do direct service, um, what we generally do on these days of service, um, invasive species removal, um, but also direct tutoring, um, cleanups and beautification, policy and governance where students uh, participate in the political process um, or may even run for office, community organizing and activism, um, using individual or collective act action to um, mobilize others, philanthropy, um, and then social entrepreneurship and corporate social responsibility is sort of the sixth pathway. I actually think it's two pathways. Um, one is social entrepreneurship and one is CSR. Um, but we look at ways in which uh, we're thinking about how can we use these um, concepts to unify uh, what may otherwise be a, a by, by force uh, a disparate experience for students. Um, and that way we can introduce, and, and I should say we have um, usually a class of between 2,000 and 2,500 incoming first year students. Um, this year, we don't, we obviously don't yet know, but it will be somewhere um, in the neighborhood of between 1,000 and 2,000 students are expected, probably in the higher range uh, based on current projections. Um, so this is just some of the stuff that we're thinking about. We're thinking about, should we do a hackathon? Should we have um, other work with our partners to do other kinds of service? Um, but I think now I'm gonna to move to hear from you about what you're thinking about for this um, uh, day of service. Um, we wanna know how, you, how does your campus have a 9-11 day of service? And I saw that some of you in the chat um, indicated um, it's, is it Jean or Jean Couture um, from St. Anselm was saying that you've done an annual 9-11 day of service and several others um, do 9-11 day of service. So how are you rethinking yours? Um, and uh, how are you reimagining it this year? So hi, uh, it's Jean Couture. And um, so we haven't done the 9-11 for a couple of years. So I, when I saw this, it was kind of around our orientation because we do an annual one during our orientation. Mm -hmm. um, however, I also, it was interesting to hear that the idea that this year for the 9-11 um, may be you know, more participation than ever. I, when I first saw, I was actually thinking to the fall of 2021, I was trying to think ahead because it would be 20 years. So, so in my head, I, I could see us um, bringing that back. Um, you know, in, the, in, in um, 2012, um, really 2011 through 2014, 15, I guess, went through uh, 15 or 16, there was more of a push on our campus. And I think it was because of our student leaders at the time. Um, and the annual piece has kind of, um, we haven't done one, I feel like, since 20, I think the last year we did one was 2015 or 2016, for the, specifically for the 9-11. Um, but that's also when we brought back, so the day of service had happened during orientation consistently, um, but then kind of disappeared as we were doing the 9-11 one, because our center um, for, for community engagement, which is our Amelia Center, um, we're a small campus, so typically we're, we're, we're a little under, we're around 2,000 students. Um, and so to do both events, one for orientation and then another one for 9-11 um, was a little bit of taxing. So um, we've kind of shifted where we've done 
now during orientation versus the 9-11. Um, and like I said, originally the students were driving that. So for the for this year, when we're envisioning our orientation one, which is traditionally, um, an, we do um, we do a two-part orientation, one in June, which we're moving to online, and then we do another one in August, which is um, we're hope, hoping to be on the ground for that. Um, uh, but that day of service will look different where our community partners have already talked about the fact that we can't necessarily to them um, in many cases. Um, so how we can do something on the ground on campus and kind of revisioning it that way and whether there are some virtual aspects to that. Um, I don't have my colleague on here. I told her I would join this. Um, she's more, she is our director of, of our um, community engagement center. Um, and so she's been working on that. We're on a couple um, committees together to kind of um, look at how we might live that out. So we're still exploring. This was just for me to hear from others um, how we can explore that um, for orientation this year and then maybe for 9-11 but looking forward to 9-11-2021 is kind of where I was also thinking. That's terrific. I'm, I'm really glad you're thinking towards 2021 and we've had the same issue um, in terms of um, orientation service and then 9-11. Um, for many many years our convocation was as close to 9-11 as possible uh, but we recently shifted to August to August for orientation. Uh, but we have made a point to keep the um, the focus on 9/11 on that day as well. Um, and then looking forward to 2021, we're hoping for uh, or not hoping for we're planning for a day of service on the 9/11 day. Right. Have other what are others doing for their um, for their partners? Um, so can I just add really quick, yeah, so sure. just so people understand for us, because I know some um, of the larger universities and also I feel like some of the more North Carolina, South Carolina ones, um, I think you guys typically start your year a little earlier. And that's why when I, when I said to plan two, for us it kind of came close in terms of timing, because our August orientation is towards the end of August. We usually start, um, some years it's like the um, August 21st, 22nd range, some years it's the August 27th, 26th, 27th. Mm -hmm. So to tie that then two weeks or three weeks later to the 9-11, that's why I say we've kind of gone one or the other. Just mm -hmm. um, at our incoming class, once again, so I know other folks share that we're obviously smaller. Um, we typically have anywhere from 520 to five, well, we've been as high as 600. That's a little big for us typically for an incoming class, um, but our range is usually around um, the 525, 530 to 550 mark as an incoming class. Great, thank you. Um, I know that we've got a couple comments. Annie is using leftover funds to um, to purchase more trash picking and work on a robust trail system. Annie, did you want to say any more about that? Okay, sure. Let me start my video too. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Annie from Illinois State University. Um, we do a month of uh, we call it September service days. So throughout the course of September, we do a variety of kind of drop-in service options for students. And so we are really having to rethink um, how that looks um, come fall. And so one of our ideas, uh, we have a trail system throughout um, Bloomington Normal, which is where we are located in Illinois, um, about 30 miles of trails, which is actually getting a lot of use uh, right now uh, as people are um, enjoying, you know, social distancing and taking walks. So um, it was actually my grad who had the idea of why don't we purchase some trash pickers um, and then we can do multiple trail cleanups where we can limit the amount of students who can join us. Um, it's all walking distance from our office and campus. Um, that's something that we have really been concerned about is we normally transport students in vans. Um, and so we thought, you know, how do we can we practice social distancing in a van and what does that look like? And so we've been trying to think creatively um, to offer service options that don't require transportation um, that or that we can walk to. And so um, that's one of the things that we are doing. Um, another idea that we've had is uh, we work with a local organization it's called the Back to School Alliance. They pack 
backpacks for uh, kids in the area with school supplies. Um, and we have traditionally done a big backpack stuffing event during our welcome week. Um, but we know that welcome week is going to look very, very different for us. And so we are working with that organization to what we're kind of thinking is like a pop-up stuffing event where we set up tables in our on our lawn of our office um, you know throughout the course of the week limiting the amount of people who can join us and do some stuffing events um, over time instead of you know traditionally we've stuffed 500 backpacks in about 20 minutes and it's been kind of chaotic um, but those backpacks are needed throughout the course of the year not necessarily right in August and so we are kind of looking at how we can we can adapt meet community partner needs, um, but still practice social distancing. So that's just two of our ideas that we're working on right now. Fabulous, thank you so much, Annie. That's really useful. Um, Lindsay, did you wanna um, talk a little bit about what you've posted? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I was just sharing, I was on a call recently with um, our partners at Campus Compact in North Carolina, and there was a, a lot of different campuses on there, and they were talking about um, how they've heard from, or we've all heard from partners about just um, maybe like administrative things that they might not have staff for that they can do from a distance. So it's really easy to update a volunteer database or update a website or create a marketing campaign or create a flyer or something. You can, you can totally do those things um, not on site. And so maybe it's thinking about things that maybe are not the most thrilling to some students, but what partners might actually need uh, for the time being. Um, and I think the other thing that we heard from um, some of the campuses was providing opportunities for healing. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that's going to look like, um, but it's, you know, we are not alone in the struggle. And so the partnerships that we've created on our campuses in the community um, are really vital to a lot of our success. And so a lot of our partners are struggling just as we're struggling mental health wise and all sorts of things. And so how can we provide um, opportunities for collective like reflection or um, or healing spaces in, in whatever format that might look like. And so again, that's also something that you could do virtually if you need to. Um, I love the idea of a hackathon. Um, I think that's an awesome idea. Um, and I think that is something our partners could definitely uh, get a lot of use out of. Great. I, I love those ideas. And I, and I think it, if there's an opportunity to talk with partners in a, a, a real way um, that allows a conversation to be had without unnecessarily raising expectations about what partners might need, um, at, as part of this, these um, days of service, it would be really useful um, to be able to hear what's needed um, without, but also knowing that you may not be able to provide everything that's requested. Um, I think it's really important to have those conversations. Um, Alex, um, I'm glad to hear that you're um, going back to working on 9-11 day of service. Can you talk a little bit about what how you made that decision and um, what's happening? Sure, happy to. Can everyone Thanks. hear me? Yes. Awesome. So uh, typically we have done a kind of a fall day of service the first Saturday after class has started in, in August. Um, and so uh, that was kind of told to us that they wanted us to do that during those weeks of welcome. Um, but we are in the in the process of uh, being able to have that switch for the fall, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, I used to be a high school social studies teacher, U.S. history teacher, so um, and I, I do all of our democratic and voter engagement initiatives, but also oversee our days of service. And so um, I'm hoping to kind of do a, 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 a meshing of um, memorializing 9/11 with um, also doing hopefully some direct service. Obviously, we're going to have to work with our partners to. Um, you know, limit the amount of students that go to the, a lot of typically a lot of um, a lot of senior facilities. So obviously that may be off the table completely. Um, but I like some of the ideas of, you know, what can we do on site to support those community partners um, and the residents there. But we also work with a lot of um, uh, community gardens, which I hope will be okay, you know, outside distancing, that kind of thing. 
Um, but I also really like the idea of some of the other stuff, uh, especially with the pathways that you mentioned a little bit ago of being able to, you know, what are some things that we can do that isn't necessarily direct service, but is service, is memorializing 9-11, is celebrating our democracy, is getting us ready for, you know, uh, elections in, in, in November, that kind of thing. Um, you know, whether it be how to engage with our elected representatives in our democracy, um, you know, how to advocate, um, you know, how to community organize. So I, I think, you know, moving forward, you know, service may look different, but it's it's still service and it's still um, something that, you know, is going to be beneficial for them for their civic engagement moving forward. That's that's fabulous. I, one of the other things we um, intend to do, um, and I hope everyone will intend to do, is to register their students to vote um, on their day of service um, or as they come back to the campus. Um, there are lots of tools that can help them, even if they are, um, even if they're online, um, even if they are voting remotely. Um, lots of tools where they can find out uh, where to register and how to vote um, where they are. The other thing you mentioned that um, sparked a, a thought for me is um, working with senior citizens centers. Um, this might be a good opportunity to think about whether there's a way to create a, for better, lack of a better term, a pen pal relationship between students and seniors in the community that could be done on a virtual basis and kicked off um, through this day of service. It's just an idea. Um, Sarah Grupo, it's so nice to see you. Um, and can you talk to us a little bit about what you'll be doing and truth in advertising? I formerly worked with Sarah um, at George when she was at George Washington. She's moved on to Princeton now. <laughs> Yes, hi everyone. Uh, yes, the video from Freshman Day of Service was one I recognize. <laughs> um, uh, currently, I'm at Princeton University and the program that I oversee is an immersion-based program uh, connected with our incoming class. Um, and typically, it's um, a week-long program that actually takes place off campus with students living in community. Um, it's kind of, if you thought about alternative break programming, pre-semester immersion programming, days of service and throwing them all together. Um, that's typically uh, what our program is like. Um, and right now we're in the, the fun game of not knowing what fall semester will be looking like. And um, our president is quite conservative in his decision making. And so we're not going to know for a very long time um, whether or not our campus, um, which is heavily residential, um, will in fact uh, have students on it um, come the start of the year. So a decision was made that all of our programming that involves uh, anything connected with orientation for the incoming class will be virtual. And so what we've been looking at is um, still utilizing small groups. So having students be in virtual small groups facilitated by upperclassmen um, leaders, um, but heavily making them uh, dialogue based, um, also having them be aspects of where the students are being introduced to the new community and so for us that includes not only Princeton uh, but Trenton and the kind of Mercer County um, so having students be able to learn about the um, the structures that are in place the nonprofits that are in place and in creating spaces virtually um, for interaction with our partners um, less direct service more awareness more um, understanding what social issues um, are underlying, um, really kind of talking about the opportunities and aspects for the students once they are um, on campus that they're gonna be able to engage in, um, but really also focusing on, um, I believe someone else mentioned, kind of creating those spaces of reflection for students. So our, thema the, our overall thematic is really thinking about what does it mean to be a member of a democratic community um, as you are entering um, this new space and taking on these new identities, how does where you are um, and what you've lived, how does that play into it? What do you bring to those spaces? Um, so it's going to be um, very highly reflective um, and um, a program that will span days, um, but not be as obviously immersive, um, but is something that we're kind of looking at uh, right now because um, for us, um, the likelihood that all of our students will be on campus because they're coming from all over the world um, will probably not be likely. So we wanted to have at least a program in place that everyone would be able to access. 
Um, and so that's kind of the general idea. So Amy, when you were sharing kind of uh, some of Stanford's pathways, it's kind of some of those similar pieces. Um, but the other resource that we've been thinking of um, developing and really trying to push is these pieces about students engaging locally in their home communities. So how can they do that well? How do they make those connections? Just because you're not with us um, and maybe not collectively doing it here, how are you engaging at home? And so for me, part of coming on and listening and seeing what was happening with 9-11 um, day was to think about those kind of national partners, other partners that we can, you know, encourage students to look for in their home communities. So it's not necessarily something that would be run out of like our own partnerships that we maintain, but rather some of the larger, more national ones, regardless of where students are. So really trying to in, um, integrate that uh, more holistically into the event, because if they are not you know, I feel like all of us are doing these dual planning streams, like if they're here, if they're not here. Um, and so right now we're trying to assume um, for the standard of planning and access and equity that we will do something online, that we will create these resources um, and that we can kind of engage them that way. That is fabulous. And, and I love that um, you are, it, you're, building something that is separate but together. So they're being civic, maybe separately, but you're con connecting them together through the reflection and through the, um, the planning and orientation piece. So I think that's fabulous. Um, and we will learn from that. And we're trying to think about how to do that as well, because as you know, we use small groups as well. Um, yeah, I, I think that small group piece is something that's going to be really critical, especially as we're finding ourselves in this new kind of virtual environment and like what lessons we can learn from that. Yeah, I mean, it, this is the way people may get to know each other, sitting in a room, um, looking at a screen as we are. Um, and so that it'll be important for them to see the same faces over and over again. Um, Ryan, I see that you've got some, um, some interesting ideas as well. Yeah, thanks. I'll try to make this work. Hopefully, I'll keep sleeping here. Uh, and if, oh. I have to, if I have to mute myself, uh, my apologies. Uh, but... Um, we do a number of service projects on 9-11 uh, as well. Uh, we typically run about a thousand CC led projects where we have student staff um, taking students into the community in our vehicles. And like others have mentioned, that will be a bit challenging this year, um, but uh, hopefully able to make that work with some of our outdoor organizations, the trail cleanup ideas, the planting, uh, cleanup at local community gardens and plantings at community gardens, those types of things, uh, hopefully still available to students. You know, as a land grant university, uh, our, our you know, part of our mission is to give back to the community, right? And so, um, like Sarah was mentioning, we're we're doing some planning to help students get involved in their hometowns too. We do a lot of work with our global campus already, so we have some experience in doing that. Um, and so, uh, letting the students know that we can help them get involved in their hometowns too. So, having those databases where uh, students can plug into is helpful for us. And you know, we use Give Pulse as a platform for that. We also post our things. Uh, to, to this uh, service website when, when that happens. Um, just trying to keep our ear to the ground with community organizations too, you know, trying, uh, you know, trying to stay out of the way at the same time, you know, all of us are trying to figure this out right now. We're, everybody's still in the thick of everything. So trying to balance staying out of the way, but also lending a hand where it's needed. And so looking how we can leverage some of our resources here in town, uh, if students are gonna be back this fall, if not, just trying to plan for that. We're not quite sure what that's gonna look like. You know, we've got 20,000 students that live here in, in a town of 30,000 people. So how can we leverage some of our resources in town to help uh, the local organizations uh, manage their uh, community volunteers as well? Um, so just all sorts of ideas. The senior center ideas, we'd love to, I'd love to get some games set up with seniors. The, I like the pen pal, but some digital games. We're always doing bingo and wee bowling, things like that at the senior center. It's challenging to get those things set up remotely. I think it can be done, but it takes a lot more legwork on the ground. Again, trying to stay out of the way of those organizations. Don't want to put too much on their plates to say, you know, while we're trying to do too much. Um, uh, but I did love their idea of uh, creating some signs outside. You know, I think that's one way. It's always nice to see the students involved with community members as well. Not that students aren't community members. I hate to make that distinction, but seeing them working alongside the families who also live in town uh, is always fun. So. If there's drive-by parades, they can get involved in making signs to cheer up seniors, the local senior centers, doing those types of things. Just trying to be creative, that's all. Yeah, it's, it sounds very creative and sounds really good. Um, and I think if you're in a town where um, 
the students are such a large percentage of the population, it's really important that they are there to be customers um, and supporters of local businesses and helping to, um, to build up the community economic base as well. And so it's good. I hope that your students will go back if they can um, to school. Any, uh, are there other thoughts that folks had and, or questions that you might want to pose? I've been thinking a little bit about how um, how we can use social media um, to facilitate reflection, um, to build collaboration. Have people um, thought this part through? Amy, uh, if I could just jump in there for a minute. One of the things that we piloted last year, which was really successful, and that was mostly at the elementary and middle school levels, some high school, uh, but we were, uh, we created sort of an umbrella social media campaign that encouraged people who were doing projects, good deeds, and other service activities for 9-11 to just simply post on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, a photograph with them holding up a sign indicating what they did with, with uh, the hashtag, I think we used 9-11 uh, 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 good deeds or 9-11 deeds, I'd have to look at it. Um, but we were gonna, uh, sort of modify and tweak that toolkit for higher ed use because ultimately what we're just looking to do is see people communicate what they're doing. Uh, we're not trying to be prescriptive because clearly you can see that there are just a, a multitude of ways in which uh, individuals and organizations can help out in the community and we want them to focus in on the needs that are specific to that, you know, the, the, their populations and, uh, you know, their cities and townships. So. Uh, we know it's going to be different. One of the things we want, though, is the unifier at the social media level and to be able to get imagery. And we know pictures, particularly through Instagram, you know, even TikTok, you know, are important today. And so if we can um, maybe publish a uniform um, a hashtag that can be utilized, maybe we can try to uh, bring everybody together around the same, uh, at least a communication concept. They can do whatever they want to do, but that way we're all doing the same thing. That's when it'll generate the kind of traction that will amplify itself. Yeah, I, I love that idea. And um, I, I think we should come up with one hashtag and uh, put it out there. It would be great. Yeah, I posted in the uh, chat the a link to the uh, sort of the good deeds uh, lesson plan that we piloted last year. And again, it's more for younger audiences, but take a look at it because a lot of it is very applicable to people of almost any age. Yeah, that is actually not a bad segue into the next slide we have, um, mm -hmm. which is um, a toolkit that, um, that we created for higher education um, with our friends at 9-11 Day. Um, it is a, it is a toolkit for in-person service, um, but we hope that it will be somewhat useful to y'all um, as you go ahead and plan your days of service. Um, it's we you can access it online at the um, at the link posted. Um, we really this particular um, toolkit is really how to build a day of service. Um, and some helpful tips on reflection and thinking about, particularly about diversity and inclusion and how to make sure um, that students and um, anyone participating in a day of service are really thinking about what does it mean to work together with people who are different from ourselves um, and how can we build uh, cultural intelligence and uh, cultural understanding and empathy through service. I think those messages are exactly the same uh, in a virtual environment as they are in an in-person environment. Um, so we particularly wanted to, um, to share this with you. And the other thing that we would like to do as we were thinking about creating this is we'd love to be able to come up with, we'd love to create a tip sheet um, based on the um, conversations we've been having here um, that we would post alongside this that um, just lists the ideas um, that, that you shared with us today, some that we heard in a K-12 conversation that we had um, last week and for others in other conversations that we have going forward so that um, we can share this with everyone. Um, this is, uh, yep, 
So I, I was just going to chime in because I think that the, um, you know, we all know with service learning, reflection is such a key part of the, of the process. And we heard a lot from the, um, the K-12 audience that we spoke to last, last week, the same thing that you all are saying around the importance of mental health and that healing. I think that's such an important word. And that that's just sort of like a, a component of that reflection that's, that's already part of what, you know, what the service learning process and that this toolkit really focuses on too. And you know, thinking about the messaging, as Amy was just saying, this is about service. And as it said so clearly in the video about 9-11 Day, the whole reason for 9-11 Day, it's, it's about coming together and serving together in the face of tragedy, and that's really kind of what we're we're looking at right now. So the messaging for, you know, the um, service in honor of 9/11 is really the same sort of motivate motivation to be serving right now. And you know, again, serving the first responders, serving in honor of those who, whose lives have been lost. Um, it's all it's all connected. So I think it um, makes a ton of sense. And that's, you know, even though this toolkit was not was written before March 2020. <laughs> Um, when this all started, so it's not about how to do virtual service specifically, but it still sort of has that, you know, really relevant frame um, with the steps for, of service learning. And I would really like to, to just say, one of the things that we saw after 9-11 was this incredible outpouring of service and giving to one another um, and, and mutual aid and mutual caring and empathy. And sadly, that um, that tends to go undercover um, or get pushed, goes below the surface um, over time. And I hope that the work that we are doing um, for the pandemic and through this virtual service will allow us to keep that spirit of connectedness alive and, and through our reflection, um, really think about how we can keep this spirit of service and uh, mutual caring alive. Um, as you can see, this slide is um, really just about the best practices in higher ed service learning. Um, the toolkit is organized um, in a simple framework around preparation, preparing for service, implementing it, um, assessing it, and then uh, demonstrating it, um, assessing and reflecting. The preparation is so key in terms of uh, working with our community partners. Um, and then questions, comments? We very much want to um, continue to talk with you. Um, reach us at 911day at gwu.edu. And I know David Payne shared his uh, email address in the chat as well. Um, if you'd like to reach out to him in specific about the resources and um, the and the work that of 911day.org, um, it's really important for us to continue to serve this year and to connect the work that we are doing. Um, and as a lot of us have talked about, the 20th anniversary commemoration is in 2021. And so we want to serve this year. And then we want to bring a very large scale commemoration in 2021. Jay, anything? Well, you're right. Um, you know, I think hopefully, I think we all hope that things will be settled to the point where we can um, come together and serve in more traditional ways, but even if we cannot, and it has to be more virtual and through distance, uh, social distancing, well, then um, that, that speaks to an even greater need uh, for such service, you know, from coast to coast. So um, we're very optimistic though, of course, that regardless of what the environment is gonna be, it's gonna be uh, an extraordinary outpouring of both remembrance, which is which is part of the day, and what have we learned in 20 years, and uh, to all get on a positive path forward by helping those uh, who are in need and who could use a, a helping hand in whatever way we can all make a difference. So uh, thank you to everybody on this call for everything that you all do, because it's pretty extraordinary just in the short time to hear about so many efforts uh, that are happening all over the country. So we're very appreciative. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Amy, for hosting this call and for giving us the opportunity to talk with all these wonderful people. And thank you all uh, for your contributions both today and every day. And thanks, Emily.
Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you to our guests today. It's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you, everyone, for participating and know that, you know, we're all figuring this out together and we're here to support each other. And, um, you know, we'll be sharing information with each other um, after this call and, and again, finding other ways to share what everybody is planning to do. So thank you again for the guests today. And again, we'll have some more listening sessions from the knowledge community that we'll be uh, sharing with everybody if you want to have these continued conversations over the summer. So have a great day. Great. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you all. Thank you.